Okay, our first presenter is Barry Horner, who was here last year, and he wrote what I think is the best book uh, uh, dealing with the issues relating to Israel called Future Israel. And he talked about that last year. And this year he's going to talk about uh, the fact that uh, how, how people like Gary Burge, who you've been introduced to uh, at Wheaton and other places like this, how so-called evangelicals, you know, are saying that Israel has been disinherited, Israel doesn't have any promises and all of these kinds of fads and things like this. So uh, he's going to deal with specifically uh, Gary Burge in uh, his, his talk. So he is originally from Australia. I guess you're an American citizen now? No, I still got a green card. It, okay. I probably, it cost a thousand dollars, you know, and I'm oh. saving up for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've heard some people get. But I want to be. I'm, I'm all uh, for it. You know, okay, I really yeah. am. <coughs> uh, you have to change that accent <coughs> a little there, but uh, <coughs> just kidding, of course. That's right. Uh, but some people get in the country for free. I've heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I've heard about that. Yeah. And he. <laughs> He's a pastor somewhere in Arizona, if you can pronounce that uh, place. Suarita. Thank you. Suarita. Uh, and so we're, we're very happy to have you again, Barry. Thank you very much, Tommy. It's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, such a, a, a good place for interaction of souls in terms of Bible truth, and uh, that is uh, very much what I enjoy. It's refreshing. Meet old friends, you know and uh, really, you know, back and forth with ideas uh, in the Word of God. That is a great challenge. However, uh, let me get down to business now. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you'll notice from the notes uh, that I am just going to give a brief introduction regarding a trip I had over to the United Kingdom and Holland. I spoke 32 times, and actually... Um, Again, it, it's the book that did it. It, it, it. I think if it wasn't for the book, I wouldn't be here. But it's amazing. I, I am astonished at uh, the interest that has been shown in it. And um, it reminds me of Martin Luther, I think, when he got his doctorate. He was asked, you know, well, you know, is that worth anything really, you know, in the ministry? And he said, if I can use it for the glory of God, I will use my doctorate. And I feel about this book the same way. I, I honestly tell you, when it was in process of writing, I remember saying to my wife on another number of occasions, you know, I said, Anne, I, I sense just being guided in this. I, I, I really do, you know, and you can take that for what it's worth, but that's just the truth as it was in preparation. <laughs> uh, 32 times in England I was... Uh, more disappointed with the state of evangelical Christianity there than ever before. Uh, Forty years ago, I had been to St. Paul's Cathedral, and uh, it's a fascinating building to look at and go in. And so I thought, when I had a day off in London, I'll go back there. And I went there and walked up the steps to the entrance and went inside, and there was a sign. It said, entrance fee, 12 and a half pounds, you know. And there was a lady there, and she was looking at that too, and I said, that's obscene. I said, I'm not paying 12 and a half pounds, and I walked down the stairs. And uh, 40 years ago, that wasn't the case, you see. Um, my personal belief is, and I don't want to offend anyone who may have Episcopal roots here, nevertheless, I believe the Church of England is very much to blame for much of the low state of evangelical Christianity in, uh, in the United Kingdom, and also, too, the influence within the Anglican Church in terms of scholarship of replacement theology. I was just talking to Tommy and said, I mean, whether it's uh, John Stott or whether it's Stephen Sizer or all of these others over there, there's a whole club of Anglican scholars, and they quote one another. You'll notice, read their books, read Sizer, he'll quote N.T. Wright, and so forth, and there's a whole club of them. I, I said to a friend the other day, I said, if only we could get a breakthrough of one man in the Anglican church of a scholarly nature who could break through there, and that's very hard anyway. And I, I, I just say that, the state there is, is not good at all. I've, I've been there about six or seven times, and uh, it, it's worse than I've ever seen 
I mainly went to little fellowships, one group at the London School of Theology, they had 200. That was good, very arousing. In Holland, um, more interest in Israel, far more interest, I think, in things Christian even, relatively speaking. Uh, and I, I was at meetings there of up to a thousand uh, churches of five, six, seven hundred. Uh, one area that really challenged me, and I'm still uh, really uh, think about this and want to write something about it, and that is I did encounter over there a form of dual covenant theology in which uh, they say that we need to comfort Israel according to Isaiah 40 verse 1 and we need to help them make a leer, return to the land and help them in the, the nation over there in the Middle East in their uh, you know, stance against the Arab nations. We ought to support them materially and, and with love and just, again, get alongside them, but we don't present the gospel to them. And that I could not abide at all. Uh, I, I, I really am challenged by this, and uh, I think I'm going to miss out on a trip to the Holy Land on account of that, because to begin with, I was off a trip to the Holy Land, and then later on, this issue came up, and uh, I, 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 I must be, I think, like Paul and proclaim the gospel to the Jewish people as well as to the Gentiles. And I couldn't yield on that one iota, uh, you know, in a sense. And uh, that was something that challenged me, and I want to write something on that because that just is... Uh, I, I really think what it does, it shunts the gospel aside. It shunts Christ aside, you know? And it takes away from his preeminence in all things. And anyway, that happened in Holland. There were some other people I met there too. Of course, when I spoke and I sort of uh, tried to conclude on the fact that the, the Jews are sinners and they need Christ, and the Gentiles are sinners and they need Christ. And I tried to really put that at the end of my ministry each time I spoke there, and I had people come across and said, I agree with you that the gospel must be presented to the Jewish people. They're sinners just as much as the Gentiles. Well, having said that, oh, one thing that happened too, uh, while I was there, I got an email and uh, it was from a graduate of Wheaton College. And uh, he wants me to go and speak at Wheaton College uh, next year. It's already been set up, it looks like. I believe I'll be going there there are March uh, 21 for about a week. And uh, of course, you may recall, this is where Gary Burge is professor of New Testament. The uh, contact came from a Messianic fellowship on the campus there of Wheaton College. And uh, I want to read to you, just let me read this to you. This is part of the email I got, and I quote here. As I'm sure you know, Dr. Gary Burge is a New Testament professor at Wheaton College. He is not fond of our club, to say the least. In fact, he was personally hostile to the club president on several occasions, and he helped to bring in Ali Abunama as a speaker who portrayed Hamas as a peaceful organization. Though not as purposeful as Burge, most, but not all, Bible professors in Wheaton hold to replacement theology and dispensational, um, <clears throat> sorry, a replacement theology and characterize any view that Israel has a God-given national identity as a purely modern and dispensational view. Burge, of course, is the loudest and states that such a view is a heresy. So, uh, I will be speaking on the campus, and they were very excited about it, this Messianic Fellowship. So I'm going a little bit into the lion's den. Uh, brethren, pray for me when I go up there. But I don't really fear, i tell you why, and I, even in Holland I said this, you know, I said in this whole issue, we have the truth, we have the word on our side in this matter. And I believe that with all my heart. And I want to close this morning, even with an example, exegetically, of where they go astray and why in Romans 4.13, I believe, again, we understand what Paul is saying there. It's not what they say about the total, you know, pushing aside of the land and so forth. We'll get to that in a moment. Let's look at our notes here. And as I say, you've got about 39 pages here. I'm not going to cover that in the time I have, but I'm going to sort of skim through it and then you can take it home and, and, and go through it in more detail. Also, I have included here an appendix, it's Appendix A, uh, it starts on page 19. It's a brief article by Gary Burge in which he states why, academically speaking, he is not into uh, uh, restorationism, etc. 
It's interesting in that article that he states that he is of a reformed tradition. Well, I am friends, but I tell you, I don't think we're in the same ballpark there at all. Uh, when he says he's in the reformed tradition, let me explain that Gary Burge is ordained by the Presbyterian Church USA, which is uh, mainly a liberal denomination and uh, represented by Princeton Seminary. And I've read some magazines from Princeton where they say they are in the Reformed tradition, whereas they are just plainly very liberal. And uh, I'm not saying that Gary Burge is, you know, just liberal in that sense, although I want to move on now to a number of headings in this book of his. Here is the book, Jesus and the Lamb. And uh, it, it is uh, <clears throat> the New Testament challenge to Holy Land theology. Uh, on the back there are several recommendations. One of them says this must be mainly, uh, surely the, the most authoritative book on land theology coming out of the United States. Well, I tell you, uh, I, I don't think that for a moment. Uh, mind you, on the back of books, when you get those commendations there by those who anyway agree with you, I mean, they don't mean a lot really. So there we are. <clears throat> All right, in our notes here, let's look at this, shall we? The first area, I, I'm just taking various areas that uh, come up repeatedly in Jesus and the land, and I want to go through them and especially draw out where Burge is and why I believe uh, he is not uh, uh, indeed uh, one to be really highly regarded. <clears throat> For the Christian, whatever degree of learning may have been attained, it is the authority of the Word of God that must be determinative with regard to the contemporary status of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Scholars may be helpful in this regard, <clears throat> and we ought to consider them. Yet when all has been said and done, they often differ, and especially with regard to the degree to which they regard the Bible as authoritative whether fully or with qualification. They are not immune from conclusions based upon presuppositions, however sophisticated their academic technique may appear, rather than objectivity. The scholar may prove to be a good servant and yet a bad master, so that the child of God should never bow before academia to such a degree that the priesthood of the believer is somewhat compromised. Like Roman Catholicism, even evangelical scholasticism has increasingly lauded itself over the pastorate and laity, and especially by means of giving more space to liberal sources and the absorption of its language, environment, and alleged status. Hence it is vital at this juncture to uphold both the truthfulness and inerrancy of Scripture, while at the same time being sensitive to the reality that many scholars do not accept this foundational evangelical principle. <clears throat> it will be found that subjective authority upon the text, uh, that um, once the essential truth is compromised, there develops a tendency to impose subjective authority upon the text, even unconsciously, and thus <coughs> acculturate the original literal intent of the text and so end up with what is claimed to be reinterpretation or Christological insight or contemporary relevance. Now, I say this, friends, because, you know, I believe in scholarship, you know, but it must have its roots in the Word of God authoritatively believed. Once you go outside of that, then you go into all sorts of subjective and uh, human opinions. With this in mind, and, and again, we're taking up this question of biblical authority now with regard to Burge, and I have some questions about that, frankly. And uh, let me read on here. With this in mind, Burge presses his case with a welter of scholarly comments and sources, some conservative evangelical, some liberal, and others somewhere in between. So he makes the following charge. <clears throat> no carefully argued theological study <clears throat> has come from within its own ranks 
That is Christian Zionism or uh, Restorationism as, as we would believe in. No New Testament scholar has written in its defense its advocacy groups such as Christians United for Israel and Camera are generally run by political activists. Its books come from the prens of popular television preachers and lobbyists. And uh, there appears to be a tinge of scholarly arrogance here. In Jesus and the Land, there is an annotated list of 15 references for further reading. Only one, The Land and the People, an Evangelical Affirmation of God's Promise, edited by our brother Wayne House, is said to uphold the land promises as a form of land theology. However, what of, and I raise these references you know of, uh, Ron Diprose, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Dan Gruber, yours truly, David Larson, R. Kendall Solon, uh, Michael Black, and so forth. But we read further on <coughs> uh, and uh, consider this comment that he makes. And this is where I am wondering about his view of biblical authority. Let me read on him. The certain Pauline corpus has grown far beyond the four assured letters of the 19th century. That would be four epistles of Paul out of the 13 regarded as really Pauline in earlier liberal days. That's what he's alluding to here. <clears throat> the certain Pauline corpus has grown far beyond the four assured letters of the 19th century. And today, its bulk is either from the pen of Paul or from some of his close associates. Our treatment of the land in Paul need only rely on those letters that enjoy high confidence <coughs> in uh, in, uh, as Pauline. Do you see what he's saying there? We won't really perhaps consider the whole 13. We'll just go to a lesser number that have some degree of broad acceptance, even with more liberal, uh, you know, uh, circumstances. Now, we read on. Even though, this is another quote, even though there is a highly dispute, this is a highly disputed letter, he's referring to 2 Thessalonians, it nevertheless represents a disposition reminiscent of Paul in his other letters. Read the next one. This new openness, that is moving away from ethnicity and regionalism to territorial universalism, continued in the Pauline tradition and appears indirectly in Ephesians, a letter with a contested claim to authorship. Now, when you read these comments, he's referring to 2 Thessalonians and to Ephesians, both of which, in the first verse of those epistles, plainly state that they are written by the Apostle Paul. And you'll notice here, when he raises the question that there are some who don't even accept the Pauline authorship of Ephesians and 2 Thessalonians, he does not come out and say, but I believe that. Do you see the point? He leaves that open. And that's what troubles me. And uh, let's read on this next quote. Even its author and origin, and he's, re he's referring now to the book of Revelation, are uncertain. The book is credited to John, that is, uh, but, is this, but is this the same as the author of the fourth gospel? Is this another John, someone called the Elder? Is this John the Baptist? Dear friends, when a man is calling for a, uh, you know, uh, for scholarship, and that we don't have scholarship, but he does, and then he makes this comment that the book of Reve the Revelation, a, a, a considered author, John the Baptist, who was beheaded about 30 AD, roughly. <laughs> you laugh. I laugh too. It's there. You, I, I, I've read that passage over and over again, and I cannot believe that he would say such a thing as being professor of New Testament at Wheaton College and Graduate School. He goes on also here. 
Um, I have been invited to debate some of their leaders who hold to Christian Zionism, etc., and find myself with people who have no training in theology. How can such a widespread movement in the church be successful without a thoughtful undergirding? And I would say, physician, heal thyself, you know. <laughs> now we move on. There is a disturbing tone here concerning the assertive, rarefied air of theological academia where liberal scholarship predominates not only with regard to questioning the authority of the Pauline epistles as a whole, but especially with regard to the estimate here as to charge the Bible with containing documents that fraudulently attest to Pauline authorship. And uh, you remember, of course, years ago, uh, Harold Lenzel raised this question in the battle for the Bible and the Bible of Balance, and I, I think his argument was very valid. Uh, the squirming and wriggling of some scholars, you know, trying to say they're evangelical, but Paul didn't write Ephesians or Second Thessalonians and all that sort of thing, you know? And uh, clearly Burgess into this, seems to me, because he does not say that I believe in the full canonicity and authority of the 13 epistles of Paul. He says that nowhere. He doesn't want to do it, it's obvious. A little further down now, we go down further, I'm dropping ahead here, down the bottom of the page. To be quite frank, there is good reason for wondering what exactly Burge regards as the canon of both testaments in the Bible. Further, this leads one to be curious as to what exactly is his view of biblical inspiration. When I was in London, speaking at the London School of uh, Theology, I was at a panel discussion there, and I raised this issue. Darrell Bach from Dallas Seminary was sitting on my right-hand side. And uh, I raised the question, as I've raised it with you here, about Burge's view of authority of Scripture. He jumped in and said, oh, he says, I know Gary, he's a friend of mine, and he has to sign an inerrancy statement every year. To which I replied, yes, and I know there are other professors too who will sign that inerrancy statement just to maintain their tenure when they don't really believe it. And I then talked to Darrell afterwards and I, he sort of, we, we were going back and forth in this. Oh, I know, Gary. So I says, yeah, but I said, um, Gary Burge does not, while he raises this question about Ephesians 2 Thessalonians, he doesn't say, but I believe these are the word of God and of the Apostle Paul. I said, he leaves that open. And Daryl then said, oh, well, he said, that's different. And that was the end of the conversation, you know. Let's move on. I won't get through half of this, but uh, you've got the notes and I hope you'll read them when you get home. The next heading I've got here is Abraham as the covenantal father of Judaism and the Gentile nations. That Abraham is the father of the Hebrew or Jewish people is not a matter for debate. As a sign of the covenant, circumcision was ordained at the ratification of God's original promise. Covenant details were essentially the same as formerly described, namely the promise of the blessing of God can, coming upon a distinctive nation, a land, as an everlasting possession for that nation and further result in blessing upon all the nations of the earth. Replacing Abram, the new divinely given name Abraham uh, would represent him as the father of a multitude. However, it appears to be the territorial factor at this juncture that troubles many supersessionists and leads them to reject, inject conditionality into the eschatological equation. Bird uses that term on a number of occasions. Conditionality. You know where that is leading, I hope. The result is the virtual nullification of the Abrahamic as well as the Mosaic covenants because of disobedience and the claim that the new covenant trumps all that has passed. Burge is no exception here when he writes, and we quote, Reformed theologians are not at all convinced that the promises to Abraham, much less Moses, are still theologically significant today. There it is. It's as plain as you can get there. The work of Christ is definitive. 
there is one covenant and it is with Christ. And if we had time, we could go back to Jeremiah 31 and look at that one covenant, the promised new covenant, and see how indeed that promised new covenant there very much relates right back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and on to Christ. But, you know, when you read this, let me ask a question which you'll answer immediately. Why do you think they want to get rid of the Abrahamic covenant? It's very obvious because it presents such a challenge with regard to the land. How can you go and look at the original promise of the Abrahamic covenant and move on in the ratification to uh, Isaac and Jacob and the repetition of the covenant in that setting there? How can you look at that and say that the land is not integral to the whole of the covenant there? And the fact that it is there absolutely uh, unilaterally in chapter 15 there where the covenant is cut and God sovereignly establishes the covenant and puts Abraham in sleep, etc., etc. And yet you read here, do you see what Burge is doing here? And he's not alone. You could quote many of them. Size and these others, they'll all do the same. They don't like the Abrahamic covenant. Somehow they've got to squash its effectiveness, you see. And that's what's going on here. Because of time, I'm going to press on now. Let's move on to page uh, five here. And uh, uh, there's so much here in refutation of what we read in the challenge here to the Abrahamic covenant. I want you to see where Burge is. And you see, Burge is claimed to be evangelical. And I'm questioning that in terms of his view of Scripture. And now you get to the Abrahamic covenant and what he wants to do with it. All right, let's move on on page five here we have the next heading which is territory ethnicity and nationality Uh, this really deals with the question as we know in the abrahamic covenant there is the promise again of a nation and then there'll be nations Uh, the nation israel will bless through the nations coming from the nation and uh, again uh, the, the covenant there is very clear that it offers ethnicity it offers nationality and it offers territory and um what I believe is that when you talk about this matter of Israel or what is a Jew and so forth, you cannot cut up the nation or you cannot cut up your, your terminology such as a Jew and say, well, that's just an ethnic term, but there's no reference there to nationality and territory. That will not fit. A, a Hebrew, a Jew will laugh at that. Uh, for a Jew there is integrally the fact that they are an ethnic people, they are a nation, and they have a land. You, scripturally speaking, you cannot divide that up. But the supersessionist very much has trouble with it. And this is one of my problems with the fact here that he's just dealing with the land, and there's a tendency, you see, to divorce it from uh, especially ethnicity and even nationality. And that the scriptures will not, I believe, tolerate. Uh, On page 6 here, I've got a quote here of Burge at the top there, which he says, the term Israel is used exclusively for the name of a people, never a place. And I put there, in a strictly isolated sense, this is true. But when I say isolated, I mean just taking the word Israel and not putting it in the context of many references. And I've given a list of references here where when you take the word Israel, it clearly is related to the land. Probably you would say, well, of course, but you see what he's trying to say? Israel, in its pure, narrow sense, doesn't have anything to do with the land. It's just speaking about, really, Jacob and even his seed. Now, down the bottom there, I have ref- I've got a lot of references there to refute this. One I just want to refer you to is Matthew 19, 28. This is increasingly coming to me, a favorite verse. Uh, because you get the supersessionists saying, and they'll, they'll also, there's no mention of the land in the New Testament. And frankly, forgive me, I'll say, that's baloney. And look at this verse here. Look at this verse. And, and they have to do every form of twisting and turning to get around what our Saviour said here. You know, the apostles asked, where will we be in the coming kingdom? Listen to what our Saviour says here. Jesus said to them, that is his disciples, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, the palingenesia, the the rebirth, 
the introduction, if you like, of the millennium, the Messianic kingdom. You that have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. You get this uh, mindset, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, so there's no Trinity. You know, friends, it's like saying, well, the word love is not in the Acts of the Apostles. So really, the Acts of the Apostles are not concerned with the love of God. Do you know that? Look it up in a concordance. The word love is not in the Acts of the Apostles. So can you conclude, therefore, the whole question of love is not in the Acts of the Apostles? That, that is so absurd, you know? And uh, so this verse here, it, it says here, and, and it's so eschatological, it's speaking of the reign of Christ in the Messianic, the Millennial Kingdom there, and he says, you also will sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel, of course, that doesn't refer to the land, does it? Uh, and, and the point is, too, it's, it's important to remember that the tribes, the 12 tribes, have not only a demographic reference, but also very much a geographic, because the 12 tribes involve territory. We all know that, you know. And uh, that's what uh, the 12 tribes, any Jew, any Hebrews, 12 tribes, that means the 12 territories, where the 12 tribes will be, etc., etc., of course. How do you get around this, friends? There it is, it's plain. And also, in terms of what Burgess said, well, Israel strictly really just means, you know, uh, it means Jacob and the sort of the seed that'll find. It doesn't refer to the land. When you look at the context, this verse alone, let alone others of here, you know, that, that is so, again, just doesn't fit with what the context of Israel used so often in the New Testament uh, includes. Let's go over to page 7. This to me is a very important matter and even some friends of mine, we've been going over this even during our conference here, the, uh, this fact of the importance of unity, okay, that incorporates diversity. And you see this in Burge, it comes out, all supersessionists, and you see it where really they believe that in the future state, whatever they define it as, you're going to have this almost amorphous, homogenous, wispy, floating existence. That's what it is, you know? And we'll all be just clone-like, and this is so absurd. Uh, but they get into this, you see, because you cannot have Israel and the nations as diverse within the unity of the saved people of God. You couldn't have that. Even though you've got unity with diversity in the very Godhead itself, three persons in one unity of God. In the church, the body is one with differently gifted members. With Israel, even with the 12 tribes and the high priest having the breastplate, 12 different stones making up the unity of the nation of Israel. On and on it goes. And, uh, you know, they quote Galatians 3 there, you know, where it's neither bond nor free, and you know, male nor female, and so forth. And, and they so pervert that text. And I just simply say to people that quote that, I say, oh, right, I tell me, uh, let me ask you, when you became a Christian, did you become muted? Uh, when you were married, you are a Christian couple, you married a Christian lady, and there the two of you became one, one in flesh, one in spirit. Tell me, did you lose your maleness? Did your wife lose her femaleness? The perversion of Galatians 3 there is, is atrocious, you know. Especially, a matter of fact, I haven't got time, go on to Colossians 3 there, where you'll see that Paul makes a similar statement. Then read on further in the chapter, he says, men and women and slaves and children, you know. He speaks about the unity earlier on, the third chapter of Colossians. Then he goes on and distinguishes the various functional roles of a man and a woman and a child and a slave and all that sort of thing. There again, you've got the diversity within the unity. And, and this is where these folk go, and it will not hold up. I, 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 I'm going to start a list in the Bible. There are so many instances. The creation speaks of the diversity of God within the unity of what he has done. You know? It, 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 and they do this. They say, therefore, you see, Israel's gone, and really, the Gentiles are gone. They'll say, too, really, there's just one people of God. And, and it's just this, again, this somehow amorphous, uh, homogenous, uh, you know, uh, group. And it will not stand up, biblically speaking, as as I heard someone say recently, they said, 
you know, if this is the future existence, as they say, why do I need a resurrection body? This body will be changed. I'm not going to receive a new body. I'm going to have a changed and a renewed body. And therefore, why do I need that new body comprised of spiritual materiality? That's the term I like. Uh, because that's, and we've been dealing with this earlier here, the fact that, again, the Bible speaks in terms of redemption, even in Romans 8 and so forth, of spiritual materiality. And uh, what we have seen and what we have heard and touched and felt, says John, you know, concerning Christ. And he's coming back as a spiritually, you know, uh, material, glorified saviour. And this is, we've got to press this, because their arguments here just really do not stand up in terms of the scripture. Let me, uh, I've said enough on that. I could, I've got quotes here from, uh, let me go down here at the bottom of page uh, uh, 7 here. And I've got a quote of Burge. I just want to quote what he says on this, you see. When Paul's theology moved away from ethnicity and regionalism and focused on personal appropriation of faith and attachment to Christ, a move that was necessary for his Gentile mission, Paul inevitably had to abandon a Christian commitment to Jewish territorialism. This explains his lack of interest in any form of divine geography or any instinct to list the land among the benefits of Judaism. Let me answer that again. In Romans 11, Paul says, I am of the tribe of Benjamin. And again, you get this fuzziness, I think, on the part of a Gentile. This is a problem. When we Gentiles tend to come to the Scriptures, we do not see it through the Hebrew uh, focus or lens that the original writers of the New Testament had. When Paul says, I'm the tribe of Benjamin, the idea that that is just dealing merely with demography, that the people, is wrong. The Hebrew understanding when he says, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, is I am demographically one of them and I am geographically one of them. Again, another instance where to say there's no mention of the land in the New Testament, you know, it just will not fit, you see. All right, let's move on here. I've, I've got a, a section here I'm dealing with at the bottom of page uh, 8 dealing with Gnosticism and Marcionism light. <laughs> I'm not saying that uh, Gary Burge is a full-blown Gnostic or am I saying that Gary Burge is really a, you know, really a pure disciple of Marcion, etc. But I am saying the tendency of their whole philosophy and his very much leads to uh, a, a, a type of Gnosticism where again the material is disparaged and the higher level is the spiritual, and, uh, and again with Marcion, likewise, who totally had no time for the Old Testament, the God there is carnal and wrathful and severe. Even Paul's epistles, he didn't accept all of them, but he had this pure view, supposedly, so it was Paul mainly and a little bit of the Gospels, but that's Marcion, and, and this is what they do. I've got a wonderful illustration of this. I'm just flipping through pages here. Um, and uh, <coughs> let me find it. Here we are. <coughs> this uh, I found on the web. It concerns actually Colin Chapman, but this is a, just such a clear illustration of this Marcionism, this disparagement of the Old Testament. Uh, it involves what we sometimes call, I think, uh, it's been referred to as uh, uh, involving two hermeneutics. You have a basic literal grammatical hermeneutic for the New Testament. How do you find Christ in the New Testament? Well, you apply that hermeneutic, hermeneutic to the Gospels, and there you've got the historic Christ. All right, now, uh, when we go to the Old Testament, do we use that same hermeneutic there? Oh, no, no, no. No. We, we, we take what we found of Christ in the New Testament, and we impose that on the Old Testament. That's what uh, George Eldon Ladd does. And uh, he says, we need to use Christ we discover in the New Testament to reinterpret the Old Testament. See. And while the Kaiser has well said, this is two modes of hermeneutics. One for the New Testament, and then a new one imposed on the Old Testament, you see. Now, this concerns uh, Colin Chapman, and I want to read to you here... Um, Okay, just bear with me. At the top there of page 13. Years ago, this is uh, 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 the man who is the uh, 
uh, involved with a website, um, and uh, I'll, I'll go back here if I can. I think I've got it here. Yeah, let's go back to page 12 there, at the bottom there. Colin Chapman, certainly representative of Burge's anti-Judaic supersessionism, provides many classic expressions of repudiation of the Old Testament and with a Marcion-like flair. <clears throat> of course, in all of this, like Marcion, justification is claimed to be a transcendent Christology. For instance, there is the record of a most revealing encounter between Chapman and Jan Wilhelm van der Hoven of Israel, My Beloved, a website that is dedicated to the memory of Widad van der Hoven and to Rita, loving wife of Dorian Brown, survivor of the Holocaust. So van der Hoven recounts, years ago, when I was still at the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem, Colin Chapman paid me a visit. We had both received our education at the same college in London, England, so that, so that was a link. We had also both spent time serving uh, the Lord among the Arabs in the Middle East. After some time, I was asked by the British Organization for the Garden Tomb Jerusalem to take over the custodianship of that beautifully kept and serene site many believe was the place of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. I was then married to a Christian Arab woman who has since gone to be with the Lord. In my conversation with Chapman, who also perhaps, uh, due to his long years of service among the Arabs, was a willing advocate of their sentiment, I tried to bring a more biblically based response to the problems in the Middle East. But as I quoted some script from Scripture, he remarked, and I will never forget this, if you cannot prove from the New Testament that God still has a destiny for the Jewish people, then don't come with any of your Old Testament verses to prove the biblical case for Israel. To me, these have now been fulfilled in relation to the church. If you cannot prove from the New Testament, you cannot convince me. Now there's the problem. It involves basically two hermeneutics, and uh, again, you, you notice how uh, the Old Testament is treated in a sort of a Marcion-like fashion. It's not that important really, but if you want to understand it, impose New Testament upon the Old and then we'll get a meaning. Which means, incidentally, that you end up totally with a subjective view of interpreting the Old Testament. This is where Gary Burgess, he, 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 he goes along with this all the way. And um, there's another section I have here, I'm going to shut down now and just get to the conclusion. Uh, uh, dealing with conditionalism, contingency. Gary Burge mentions conditionalism and contingency there in verse 15, page 15. And uh, again, they, they've got to make the Abrahamic covenant conditional because then disobedience men, means then you've lost the promise with the Abrahamic covenant. You know. and, and that's why I say, friends, when you hear this, you say, oh, no, 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 that's not so. And, and, and that's why you've got the scripture on your side. You really do. All right, uh, let me just go... Uh, oh, look at the top there of page 8. Wonderful verse there of Charles Wesley. Glory to God whose sovereign grace have animated senseless stones, called us to stand before his face and raised us into Abraham's sons. Lovely verse that. Uh, over the page, uh, there's so much here. Study it when you go home. On page uh, 17, I've got a chart there that lists how Gary Burge quotes from the Old Testament in many ways to show how that those who live in the land who are disobedient will be punished and judged and pushed out of the land and so forth. But what he does so often is he'll quote these passages dealing with discipline that God brings upon the children of Israel on the land. He doesn't go on and mention the eschatological passages in many books that speak of the ultimate triumph of grace over Israel's disobedience. Look there and that chart. You'll see I've listed them I listed his quotes and then you go there, you read on the passages he doesn't mention, he doesn't want to mention them because they mention really the triumph of God in the saving of Israel ultimately. Then we go on, let's go to the page here. Yeah, I want to go, to, go on to page 28 and 29. I want to conclude on this because I, I'm making the point. We have the scriptures on our side. Look at page 28. 
supersessionist land theology in Romans 4.13. And um, uh, look at the bottom there. You've got my translation there of verse uh, 13. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world <coughs> was not through the law but through the righteousness of faith. Notice that again. For the promise <coughs> to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through law but through the righteousness of faith. Now, how do you interpret that? I don't think you have any trouble. You'd go back to Genesis 12 and the promises again of the Abraham covenant and so forth and that there will be a, la a, a nation and then there will come forth nations. The nations will be blessed. Yes, but what do the supersessionists do with this verse? What they do is they say, ah, see this verse here? The world has become the land and that now nullifies any reference to the land of Palestine as we know it today or in the Old Testament. It's not just that the world here represents the blessing that will come through Abraham and Israel to the nations. Not that at all. It is that, but they go beyond that. They say this verse is saying that because now the promises to Abraham extend to the world, the land is negated. And dear friends, look at the verse. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. Any one of us would say, well, of course, when it's speaking of the world here, it's speaking about the nations uh, that will be blessed as a result of the promise that was originally mentioned to Abraham, and that promise there mentioned a nation and the nations. Turn with me in conclusion here to Genesis 35. And I, I love this verse because it so um, makes it very clear what's going on. Uh, Genesis uh, 35... And uh, verses 10 and 11. Here the Abrahamic covenant is ratified to uh, Jacob. God said to him, Your name is Jacob. You shall be no longer called Jacob. But Israel shall be your name. Thus he called uh, him Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. And kings shall come forth from you. Now when the Spirit inspires Moses here to write that, uh, again, a nation and the company of nations will come from you, does he there say, therefore the company of nations will nullify the nation? Well, that's absurd. That, that, that just doesn't say that. It's not say, saying there's a nation, and then there'll be, of course, as a result, there'll be a company of nations. And when you come to Romans chapter 4, verse 13, it's speaking of the world, the promise of Abraham is, is even to the world. It's obvious it's referring to the nations here. It doesn't nullify the nation. Now, uh, in the notes, if you read on further, I've quoted here, I've got a whole slew of quotes on this, including name, a teak, and so forth. Um, uh, Gary Burge and uh, Palmer Robertson, Stephen Sizer, John Stott, and uh, N.T. Wright. You can read all the quotes. And guess what they're doing? They're all quoting Romans 4.13 to claim that the land today has no validity because the world is the land. And now the land is populated by believers in Jesus and all the believers in Jesus are spiritual Israelites. Do you see how, again, their view of, uh, again, all Christians being spiritual Jews in that sense is wedded to the fact the world is the land and every believer in Jesus is an Israelite, you see. Well, you study this and you'll see. And, and what I'm trying to say is, and I'll conclude on this thought here, and that is that when you study Romans 4.13 and then you read the list of quotes, N.T. Wright, I don't care what scholar you've got, I believe he's very wrong on this. And don't be afraid to say so because they are driven by their presuppositions. And uh, it, it, it's, it's very clear here what Romans 4.13 is saying. 
and it's not saying what they say, and that is the land has been nullified, you see. So therefore, again, be encouraged. In the Word, I believe we have the truth on our side. I tell you, friends, there are many other illustrations of this I could give you where I believe the Word is on our side, and uh, I, uh, I encourage you to use that uh, because I believe they are very weak in this area. Really. Stephen Sizer, his books, uh, look at Stephen Sizer's books. He's very weak exegetically. Uh, he, he gets a lot into the history of dispensationalism, that's all, you know. He doesn't mention, incidentally, this, I get so angry when I hear this, dispensationalism, dispensation, all the time, is that, yeah, they're, they're the culprits, you know. Uh, wait a minute, what about C.H. Spurgeon? What about Horatius Boner? What about J.C. Ryle? What about going right back to the, the 17th century, especially there, and the way that cre- premillennialism came right through there, and, and, and they were all, res- uh, so many of them anyway, were restorationists. It didn't start with dispensationalism at all, you know. It goes back to, of course, the first century too. I know what you mean, but I'm trying to say that they, uh, Sizer tries to say these, these horrible dispensationalists, you know, they're the ones who started this. That, there's a fundamental error, friends, I tell you. And uh, that's another error. I'll close there and ask questions. I, I could go on, but uh, there we are.